When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Let's pray before Mark brings God's words to us. Yeah, Lord, I thank you for that amazing passage, God. I thank you for the transformation that took place on that day of Pentecost um, amongst your disciples. And I thank you for the promise that you gave that uh, that spirit um, lives in, inside of each one of us, God, your Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, you sent your spirit as, your, as, your, as a helper for us, Lord, uh, a guide, someone to give us power and um, yeah, just strength. 
And uh, I just pray this morning as Mark comes to bring your word about uh, the Holy Spirit, God, I just pray that we'll just be challenged, um, encouraged, knowing that we are not alone. We have your Holy Spirit uh, to guide and to, to, to empower us, Lord. And I pray that we'll be willing to, to, to just hand things over to your Spirit, Lord. And I pray especially for Mark as, uh, for uh, the word that he's got prepared for us, God. I pray that you'll just um, yeah, give him the words to say, Lord, from you, Lord. Uh, and prepare us to be challenged. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, I hope it's not too much of a downer compared to last week when we, we met in the open air and we had a, a wonderful uh, time together. Uh, it is great to see you this morning. And those who are joining us from home, as well, that is uh, just so good. Um, today we remember how God poured out his Holy Spirit upon the church at the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, the Jewish people actually celebrated really three main major feasts throughout the year. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And uh, it was really a time where uh, they would stop and they would remember an event that took place uh, years ago. Uh, The Jewish people uh, remembered these three specifically, and they correspond with the journey that God took his people on uh, as they left um, Egypt. Uh, You may remember that they were slaves in Egypt. And in the first feast, God said, when you were slaves in Egypt, I want you to remember the day when the angel of death uh, passed through the streets of Egypt, and instead of you dying, the angel of death passed over you. So have a holiday every year, and remember this event called Passover. And the Passover feast has some characteristics that are significant. Because on that Passover day, back in the book of Exodus, they would kill a lamb, they would take the blood of that lamb, they would mark each side of the door, and then mark the top of the door. And that same night, having marked the doors with the blood of the lamb, they were to roast the whole of the lamb, and they were to eat it with bitter herbs and with unleavened bread. Uh, That is bread without yeast. And the reason for all of this is stated in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. It says, the blood will be assigned to you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, I want you to notice how the Lord Jesus himself fulfills the characteristics of this particular feast. I wish we had more time to go into it, but if you follow the Lamb, the theme of the Lamb through Scripture, when you get to the New Testament, the Lamb becomes the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was John the Baptist, you remember, who introduced the Lord Jesus to the world. One day, coming down to the Jordan River, John was baptizing there, and he looked up and said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And every Jew who was there listening to John the Baptist knew exactly what John was talking about. Because every year they reenacted the Passover. This said John is the lamb that's not simply going to get you out of Egypt. He's going to set you free from the power of sin. And so in the Old Testament, this sacrifice of a lamb Uh, really symbolize the covering of your sin. Notice the word cover sin. You can't see it uh, anymore. It's still there, but it's covered by the blood. That's what they understood in the Old Testament. But Jesus does not simply cover our sins. We know from Scripture that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross removes our sins, and God remembers them no more. They're not covered, they're gone. And most of us understand that and recognize that. It says in 
1 Corinthians chapter 5. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Praise God that he has provided a lamb who has died in our place once and for all. That's the first feast, Passover. The second feast that they would celebrate was called the Feast of Pentecost. And that's what we're remembering today, the day of Pentecost. But Pentecost in the Old Testament was really a Jewish holiday when Jewish people primarily celebrated the wheat harvest, but it was also associated with the giving of the law of God to Moses on Mount Sinai. So every year they came together in a pilgrimage to celebrate this event that took place that, they, that had brought them uh, out of Egypt and then had given them uh, the Ten Commandments called the Feast of Pentecost. It says in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, this is New Testament now, Pente means 50. Why 50? Because the holiday was to take place 50 days after Passover. Pentecost comes 50 days after Easter or Passover. That's all it means. And when the day of Pentecost came in the New Testament, while they were celebrating this giving of the law of God, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the early church. And there are some similarities and some distinctions between the original Pentecost in the Old Testament and this New T Testament Pentecost. In the original Pentecost, and you uh, can read this in Exodus, it says a cloud descended on Mount Sinai with a loud sound and fire. And God wrote his law on tablets of stone. And then Moses comes down uh, the mountain with this new law, this new way of living to help the people live their lives the way that God intended them to. We also know that 3,000 people died that day. Because if you remember, while Moses was on the mountain, the people got tired of waiting, and they decided to build a golden calf to worship. And as a result, 3,000 people died. And God established on that day the nation of Israel, his people, God's people. Now let me show you how this was fulfilled in the New Testament and can be fulfilled in your life. Because in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended with a loud sound and with fire. Quite dramatic, the coming of God's Spirit. We also know that instead of God writing his law on tablets, he writes it on human hearts, on our hearts. And 3,000 people didn't die. 3,000 people got saved on that day. And God established his church. So God said, start to remember that whole day when the law was given. And we're going to call it Pentecost. Now I'm going to come back to that in just a moment because this is where our focus is today. But let me just remind you of a third feast. Because the third major feast that they would celebrate was called the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was a holiday to remember the period after the giving of the law on Mount Sinai until they reached the promised land in what today is modern-day Israel. But they didn't go straight there, did they? It actually took them 40 years to get there. They, they, they didn't live in permanent homes, but they lived in tents, and they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness until they went into the promised land. And God said, have a holiday to remember those 40 years of wandering. And we're going to call it the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, here are the characteristics of the Feast of Tabernacles in the Old Testament. Number one, they were wandering and living in temporary tents. Then they were ultimately brought into their final home, the Promised Land. They celebrated it during the harvest season. It was also called the Feast of Trumpets. You might say, Mark, how is this one fulfilled? How was it fulfilled? Well, this is one that is yet to be fulfilled. Because right now, we are living on this temporary earth. You know, the Apostle Paul says that we are 
just aliens, strangers, passing through this world. I don't know whether you've heard that old spiritual song, I, I won't inflict my singing on you, but, but it goes like this, the world, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. But one day, we will be brought to our final home in heaven. And we also know just before that, there will be a, a great gathering of God's people. Because one day, and I believe it will be very soon, there will be a trumpet sound when Christ returns. Let me read it to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be forever with the Lord. But let me describe this to you. Jesus now is at the right hand of God the Father. And the Bible says that only God the Father knows when this event is going to take place. Uh, and I sometimes wonder whether Jesus turns to his Father and says, Father, is this the day? Is this the day? No, there's still more people to be saved. Jesus doesn't know about that day. Only the Father knows. But one day, God the Father is going to say, Son, it's time. Today, it's time. And Jesus is going to come on the clouds of heaven. And there's going to be a trumpet sound. And the graves are going to open up. And we who are still alive are going to meet those who have already gone before us, our loved ones in the Lord. We're going to meet them in the air. And it's going to be a glorious day. That's our promise. That's our hope as believers. The Feast of Tabernacles, as it were, is going to be fulfilled. It's going to happen, folks. It's going to happen sooner than you think. I hope you're ready for the return of Jesus Christ. But sometimes people say to me, Mark, I understand the whole Passover thing. Understand that Jesus died for me. Understand that he paid for my sin, uh, that I've been forgiven. Uh, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And I understand that he's coming back again. But I'm so confused about this one in the middle, Pentecost. I grew up in a church where I was told, Jesus died for your sins, and he's coming again. But avoid anything to do with the Holy Ghost. That's what we called it in those days, the Holy Ghost. And I didn't know any better. You know, when people are turned off by the Holy Spirit, it's usually to do with something that is not in the Bible. There is so much resistance because against the Holy Spirit. Because people have seen so many abuses and things that they have seen that they consider too weird. But I want to say to you today, like I said a few weeks ago, you can be full of the Holy Spirit without being weird. You can. God wants the Feast of Pentecost to be fulfilled in every single one of us. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when God poured out his Spirit, not many really understood it. In fact, there was a whole group that mocked the followers of Jesus. And they say, you're just a bunch of crazy, drunk people. And Peter gets up and he says, no, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. This is something wonderful that God is doing. And the Bible says of these people looking on that they were both amazed and perplexed. Maybe that's you today. When you think of the Holy Spirit. I'm amazed and perplexed. I was amazed and perplexed growing up uh, in uh, church. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Well, today, for the short time we've got left, 
I want to answer this as simply as I can. What does this mean? You know, it carries a lot of power. If you're a believer, it carries a lot of power for your life today. Through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God wants to give you power in three ways. First of all, he wants to empower me, to empower you to live righteously, to live a Christ-like life. Remember that Pentecost in the Old Testament was all about the law being given. Those external laws that tell you how to live and what to do. And you just do the best you can to follow it. But it didn't work, did it? Does it mean we do away with the Old Testament? No. Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish it. I've come to fulfill it. But God said, instead of just me giving you laws... I, instead, I'm going to send my spirit. Uh, and instead of you just getting a set of external laws to live by, I'm going to write these on you. Uh, and I'm going to take that old person, and I'm going to make you into a new person. My spirit is going to live within you. If you really want to know the main difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we need both, folks, the main difference is one is external, the other is internal. And God knew that we needed more than just having his law. We needed a changed heart. A changed heart. Over these, these last weeks, in the season that we've been in, I've asked God, oh God, would you start with me? Change my heart. Do something in my life. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. And I hope that's your prayer as well. You know, without God changing hearts, without there being an outpouring of the Spirit in our lives and in this land, probably very little is going to change. Very little. Yes, we need rules, we need reform, but those things don't change the human heart. Only God can do that. And I'm asking God on this day of Pentecost, beginning with me, that there would be a changing of hearts. That's why Peter says in Acts chapter 2, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on some people. No, on all people. I'm going to put something new in you. And here's what the result is going to be. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Prophecy Visions, dreams, is really God's way of saying, you're going to see things the way I see them. You're going to understand and have my mind on things, my perspective on things. There's going to be a new understanding in you. I remember when I gave my heart to the Lord and asked the Holy Spirit to come into my life and to write his laws on my heart. I remember the change. Having grown up in church my whole life. All of a sudden, it wasn't, I better behave myself or I'm going to go to a lost eternity. It was, Lord, I've lost my taste for sin. All I want to do is serve you, to live for you. And I'm saying to some of you today who are thinking, you know, Christianity is wearing me out. It's a bit like pushing the bus uphill. Maybe you feel like that today. The Lord wants to change that. We have a new motivation, a new desire, a distaste for sin. And he wants to write his laws on your life and change you from the inside out where it becomes your delight. Where you literally go for some, from something you have to do to something you want to do. Just fill with passion from him, from the got to, to the get to. I get to do it. And it's the most amazing thing. Well, I spent a lot longer on that one that I was hoping, but here's the second one. The Holy Spirit wants to empower me to live supernaturally. You know, God never intended his people to operate simply by what they understand and what they can do. I, for one, am very grateful for this. 
We are living in some of the most uncertain and chaotic times, certainly in my lifetime, and who knows where it's going, but I do know this. I don't want to be a person who operates on everything Mark knows how to do. I need the Holy Spirit in my life, at work. I need him operating in my life. I long for him to operate in the life of the church. Does anybody else want that in their life? I hope you do. I hope you do. I spend much time during the week asking God, God, we need you to move in our lives, in the services at Hisham FM, touching people, changing people. I long for that. And I hope you do as well. We need to live supernaturally. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are many Christians who just want to live a safe, comfortable, only what I can get my mind around kind of life. I would rather serve a God of wonders, a God of power. I, I, I would rather serve a powerful God and live a supernatural life than just simply live a natural life. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, even though Paul could have done that. He had a brilliant mind, did Paul. But it came with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, so that it might not rest on just good preaching and clever stories, but on God's power. God says, you tell people about me, and I'll confirm it by changing their lives. Last one. He wants to empower us to fulfill his mission, to fulfill his mission. Did you know that the power of the Holy Spirit isn't for our own personal entertainment? Some think that. One of the reasons why Christians want to experience the Holy Spirit is so that they can have their latest Holy Spirit goosebumps, if you like. Does he want that? No. He wants to empower you. He wants to empower you because we need to bring a message to this lost and dying world in which we live. And the real sign of the Holy Spirit isn't tambourines and sandals sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya. It's 3,000 people being saved in one day. 3,000 people. It's all about people coming to Christ. That's what it's about. Acts chapter 2, Peter says this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And at that, Peter gives an invitation, and 3,000 people get saved. Only the Holy Spirit d can do that. Only God can do that. There's no preaching that can do that. I I'm just saying, let's be a church, let's be Christians who say, you know what? I'm going to experience the Passover, the, the forgiveness of God. I I'm going to experience tabernacles one day. I'm going to go to heaven when that trumpet sounds, I'm going to be uh, with the Lord forever. But in the meantime, I'm going to be open to the work of God's Spirit in my life. Here's my definition of Pentecost, and I close with this. I don't know what you thought Pentecost was, but this is my summary. Pentecost is empowering, about empowering believers with supernatural ability to fulfill an important mission. I really think that sums it all up. The Holy Spirit wants to empower you so that you can go out and make a difference in the world today. My prayer is that on this Pentecost Sunday, we will hunger for more of God's Spirit in our lives. And if you haven't got that hunger, can I encourage you today to get before God? Say, God, would you give me a longing to have more of you in my life so that I'm not just simply living in my own strength, but you are shoveling in the back door 
as I'm giving out of the front door. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, shall we? Father, we want to thank you this morning so much for the power of Passover, the fulfillment of Passover in our lives, how Jesus once and for all, never again will a lamb have to die because Jesus once and for all paid for all the sins of the world. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died in our place. Lord, thank you that one day we're going to hear a trumpet sound and we're going to be with every believing loved one on the other side and we're going to be forever with the Lord and we look forward to that, Lord. And I pray that in the here and now that we will embrace the work, person of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of Pentecost. Lord, empower us to live righteously, to live Christ-like lives, to live supernaturally, and so to make a difference in the world for you and for your kingdom. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing a song that really welcomes the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Receive him, uh, allow him to work within you, welcome him, don't grieve the Spirit, allow him to bring his control to every area of your life. Let's stand together as we sing. God bless you. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and the shame is
Okay, Lord Jesus, I just want to pray this morning that we will be more aware of your presence. I pray that we will just want to let your spirit um, just rule in our lives, God, and just lead us. And I pray that we won't, um, yeah, just try and do things in our own strength, but let your spirit just move through our lives so that we can um, just do amazing things for you, God, for your purpose, for your mission on this earth, Lord. I thank you for that amazing picture of those 3,000 people. Um, coming to you, Lord, on that day of Pentecost. And I pray that that will be something that we see uh, through your spirit in our lives. And many come to know you, Lord, through your spirit. So I just pray. I pray for each of us. I pray that we'll just be able to submit our lives to your spirit, to your work in, in, in all aspects of our life day to day, God. I pray that we'll just be able to um, just allow your spirit to move freely in our lives. Help us to be transformed by you, God. And I thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you for your word again. And I uh, just pray that you'd be with us until we uh, meet again. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Thanks uh, for being with us again this morning. And I uh, pray you have a great week. Um, the stewards will see you out again as usual. So please just remain seated for now. See you next week. <laughs>